Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon. Um, my name is Mickey Garcia. I am the Director of Industry Solutions for a Medical Device at Master Control. And we're here to talk to you today about best practices in post-market surveillance. Um, so some of this stuff are things that um, all companies need to do. Some of these things are things that leading edge companies need to do. And some of these things that I'll be talking about today are things that in the future, this is kind of a vision for what post-market surveillance will look like in the future. For today, I want to introduce our agenda for today. Um, we'll start out by talking about monitoring sources um, first. Then I'll transition to analyzing the data. Um, and then lastly, we'll talk about uh, acting on the results. So let's start out by talking about monitoring sources. So, so let's talk about monitoring sources. Some of these sources are sources that you will be familiar with in um, post-market surveillance. So the first one that I'll talk about are post-clinical studies. Now, the good thing about post-clinical studies is that they are purpose-built for gathering data, gathering post-market surveillance information, and channeling it back into our companies, back into specifically the, the product design process. So it's great for that. The problem with post-market uh, post clinical studies is that they're not very common. They're typically expensive. The scope of them is rather limited. Um, and so these don't really get used quite as much as maybe we'd like. So it's a kind of a great source of information, but somewhat limited. The second source of information that we'll talk about today are complaints. And usually, when we talk about post-market surveillance, this is typically what people think of. They think of complaints uh, and gathering complaints. This is an area that Master Control in particular is very interested in, is doing a lot of research in, and is developing new technologies for. Um, the challenge, one of the challenges with complaints is around the, the many channels by which we can receive complaint information. So a customer might call in directly to the main office line. They may send in a, a MedWatch form. Um, they might send in a fax, an email, a call. Um, there are several sources for this information. It all needs to be aggregated um, and compiled and triaged and put through the process. Um, one of the most interesting sources that has um, come up recently is social media. So we often don't think of um, complaints as being brought in through social media. Usually we think of complaints as being directed um, directly to our companies, either through you know, one of these communication channels. But in fact, social media is, can be a source of complaint information as well. Obviously, it's not a great source in the sense that it's not very detailed information. We may not get the device back for analysis, um, but it's a very important source. So, for example, there are tools that have been recently introduced kind of more for marketing purposes. Um, there are tools like Brandwatch, Radian 9, um, there's Meltwater, um, tools like that that are used for sentiment analysis. So they're not great for... Um, analyzing a specific complaint, but they, are, they can be good for collecting and gathering general sentiment about certain products. Now, one interesting thing is that there's a dichotomy between this, a couple of different sources. So if we have products that are for the professional sector, um, doctors and hospitals are obligated by the FDA to report complaints with uh, our products. Um, and so that's a kind of a more reliable stream of information. But more and more, our products are targeted to consumers, therefore at home health, outside of the hospital setting, and more and more medical devices are intended for use by consumers. Consumers, of course, are not obligated to provide us complaint information. And even if they do, it's not going to be as structured. It's not going to be in a MedWatch 3500 form or something like that. And so it can be much more difficult but there's gonna be much more of it um, for analysis. So there's pros and cons for that, that kind of information. So one thing to think about as far as the information that we receive, the feedback that we receive about our products is 
Think of this as a, let me do this in a different color. as the distribution of the uses of our product. And it's going to look like a bell curve, where on one end of the bell curve, there were adverse outcomes. And on, one end, on the other end, there were terrific, great outcomes, fantastic outcomes. Okay, now when it comes to complaint reporting, what we're often talking about is we will receive these types, this type of feedback on this end of the scale. So if we look, talk, if we look back at the post-clinical studies, one of the problems with post-clinical studies is that they're so limited that the type of feedback that we will receive is usually something in there. We usually won't receive a lot of, because the information is limited, there's not a lot of data, we usually won't receive information about these tails of this distribution. We won't receive a lot of information about adverse outcomes or even about the great outcomes. But I would argue that this is probably not enough. This is obviously a very important subset of the data that we want to understand and analyze. But isn't it just as important to know when we're having great outcomes and what drove those great outcomes. Isn't it just as important to know what is the median kind of level of satisfaction and efficacy and safety of our other um, device uses? So this is a kind of a, a segue to the third type, the third source of information, of sources of, of post-market information, and that is just general comments and suggestions from our users, whether they be professional or consumers. It's all of this other stuff. Now, we are not used to receiving that kind of information. Uh, it is very uncommon. Obviously, you know, professional doctors and hospitals are not obligated to give us that kind of information. We try to collect it when we can through our field and um, service forces. But it's not common for us to receive this information. So the trick is, how do we get this information and what do we do with it? So that brings me to a kind of a fourth set of post-market information. And that is information from the healthcare system itself. There are a couple of interesting, very interesting initiatives actually going on right now um, in the medical device segment around gathering information for, from the healthcare system. So some of you may have heard um, the CDRH, the FDA Center for uh, Radiological and Device Health, they are um, looking for, or they're trying to implement a national um, surveillance system, uh, med a medical device surveillance system, sometimes they'll call it the MDS. Um, this system is intended to gather up data from all of the different sources, not just the data that comes to manufacturers, but also data that comes through electronic health records, data that comes through insurance companies, data that comes through um, other sources within the healthcare system itself. Um, registries, for example, are another big source of, of this kind of data. And aggregate that data and, and help provide it so that manufacturers and regulators have some feedback and can act on this kind of broader set of data that, that's being accumulated. There is actually, um, there's actually a new um, program that is being pr uh, piloted within the device and um, biologics centers called Mini Sentinel. Sentinel is a program that was authorized by Congress um, a few years ago, and it was intended to do exactly this, to try to gather all of this data um, and try to provide it for regulators to do their job better, but also for manufacturers to do their job better. Um, there was a report put out in 2015 um, regarding this uh, program, this pilot program, and how it, what the results were, uh, how it was used by CBER and CEDAR. Um, and I think slowly we will see that, that type of program adopted by the medical device industry. In particular, this MDS, this national, this national medical device surveillance system, will be the, the forerunner of putting these um, systems and processes in place. 
So that's going to be very exciting. Another source that all of these surveillance systems are going to have to deal with, um, even beyond data coming from the healthcare system itself, are, is data coming from smart devices. There's a whole other order of magnitude of information, healthcare information, outcome information, um, that could come from smart devices. So from the healthcare system, we're only going to get out what people are putting into it. But smart devices can automatically generate data. And we've already seen this in other places. You know, of course, the Internet of Things is a huge um, opportunity on the horizon, both in the consumer space, but also in the, in the medical device space. These smart devices are going to just create a, a huge treasure trove of information that we can um, analyze and, and hopefully act on. Um, and then finally, there are we often think about these external sources of information out in the field. But in fact, one of the most important and voluminous um, and actionable sources of data that we have is internal quality data. Things like nonconformances um, and not even things that go wrong kind of in this tail end, but all the things that go right, all the quality data that, that we have, all the QC inspections that we do, all of the statistical process control information that we gather, all of those things should be bundled together. But all of those things are being done in manufacturing and production, in, in essence, post-market. And all of that internal post-market data can be combined, should be combined, together with this post-market data um, to give a complete picture. Um, you know, the nice thing about that internal quality is it's very controlled, it's very structured, it's very clean, um, you know, it's, it's gathered in a very controlled environment. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that when we, when we talk about um, analysis. So these are the kind of the six sources I wanted to talk about. And so let me shift gears for a minute and talk about um, the analysis of this data. So the second phase of the post-market process is to analyze the data. So we want to analyze. And there are four aspects to this that I want to talk about. So the first one is the one that you're probably most familiar with, and that is investigations. So basically, the CAPA process. Part of this might be part of your complaints process. Part of it might be part of your corrective action process. But we have all of these sources of information. And when we um, deal with a specific incident um, out in the field in particular, or even internally, um, we usually do a triage step, um, try to assess whether there is a systemic issue with that, and then we go into the CAPA process. We do an investigation. So you can think of this kind of as a two-step investigation. One, trying to determine whether there is a systemic um, issue, and then secondly, if there is, we usually do a corrective action and do an investigation um, related to that. That investigation has a couple of very important components to it. One is the root cause analysis, so extracting the root cause uh, as part of that investigation. And then the second part is the risk analysis, trying to um, assess the risk, how does it compare to what we thought the risk was for, for the circumstances around this issue, um, and then updating our risk knowledge base. And I'll use that term again. Um, the risk knowledge base is is a shared, long-lived risk uh, management um, artifact that we have within our, our systems, ideally an electronic one that can be updated and shared um, throughout the organization. So the second piece related to um, analysis of this information is for us to be able to uh, summarize or aggregate. So these investigations usually are uh, made on an incident-by-incident incident basis. But we need to summarize or aggregate this information. Data doesn't aggregate itself. So someone has to go and do this. Right now, today, that probably means a manual step. It probably means someone going in and categorizing and coding these records, these incident records, the, these post-market surveillance uh, sources, information that's coming in, categorizing it and coding it so that it can be reused, so it can be trended and analyzed on aggregate. The nice thing is, and you know, as we look into the future, there are a lot of tools, Master Control is among um, the vendors that are trying to work in this area, to provide analysis of big data. 
So analysis of automatically trying to categorize, automatically trying to, to group and codify um, based on keywords, based on things, natural uh, language processing, um, and trying to make greater sense, pull greater meaning um, semantically out of the information that is being, this ton of information that's being gathered, especially as we get into kind of the, the EHR and the smart device data, um, which is just a huge amount of data. It's, it's, it's going to be difficult to do that manually. So these automated tools will become extremely important, probably the most important thing, the most important tool in our arsenal for doing this analysis going forward. Um, the third piece of this uh, analysis um, is to do trend analysis. So once we have the information summarized, aggregated, codified, now we can turn our, our, on our trend analysis engine. Um, right today, a lot of times that will be a management review meeting, so it might be done manually. But in the future, ideally, especially as the data is automatically aggregated, it will automatically also be analyzed for trends. Another thing to think about is, is this trend analysis going to be done by manufacturers or will this trend analysis be done by regulators? Once again, you know, you think about the Sentinel program or the MDS uh, national surveillance program, the FDA is going to have, informa is going to have access to the, that information. Other regulators will have access to that information. Insurers, payers will have access to that information as well. And so they will probably do their own trend analysis as well. So the question is, you know, are we going to be kind of ahead of the game and, and be uh, leading that charge in the trend analysis of this, of all this just kind of amount of data that's coming at us. Um, and then finally, number four is, and this is often where we fall down, is to route the information, to route the results to what I'll call the points of use. So it's great to have all of these investigations and the results of these investigations and then the results of the trend analysis as well, but eventually we have to put those things into use. Sometimes as a result of this, we might make a, 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 a particular, as a result of an investigation or a result of a trend analysis, we might make a particular change to a particular uh, process, procedure, design. Um, but we want to make it a little bit more systematic than that. We want to make it a little bit less ad hoc. And that involves, and this is really kind of one of the significant challenges that we have in post-market surveillance, is to route the results of this post-market information and post-market analysis to the actual points of use, and so that we can actually act on the results. And so that's what I'm going to uh, move to next, is talk about acting on those results. So one thing I want to talk about in terms of action is, of course, MDR reporting. This is the thing that we most often think of when we think of post-market surveillance, is what are the regulators asking for? Are we satisfying them? And that, of course, is kind of a baseline requirement. It's a requirement for us in our business as, regulated, as a regulated industry is to satisfy um, the regulators, the regulatory agencies, the FDA, and so on with uh, the reporting that they mandate. And so that's a kind of a baseline um, of what we need to provide. This is kind of a, a basic. But it's actually what most of us actually focus on. And in fact, I'll argue that we kind of need to shift our attention, think a little bit more broadly about what can we do with all of this information that we're gathering and, and working hard to, to um, collect and analyze. So the second thing that I think of is product realization knowledge base. So product realization is just a fancy word for production or manufacturing. Um, and so the idea is that we need to use this post-market surveillance data, both internal and external, the analysis of it, and bring it to the point of use in for actually manufacturing, um, distributing, testing, of the actual products that we have in the market. So the actual products that are providing this, this feedback, um, looping it back into um, the, the processes, uh, the manufacturing processes that um, create those products. Because those things, those systems, those processes, um, those sites, those facilities, those all need to um, improve based on the information that, that we're gathering. I use the word knowledge base because 
oftentimes we don't really have a place that folks can turn to that our process engineers, our manufacturing engineers, um, our pilot plants even, can turn to and say, here's what we've learned from our post-market experience, from all of these data sources. And so that is one of the, the big challenges is after doing the analysis, what do you do with it and how do you provide it to the folks that can do something with it? So this is, this is very important. And then lastly, and perhaps most importantly, is product design. Is driving a product design knowledge base. Um, this could be the product design for our existing products, the products that are out in the field and that we're gathering um, feedback on. Or it could be the next generation of products that we are bringing to market. Um, it is, so the, uh, for example, we often think of the product development life cycle as kind of this straight across um, map, uh, this stream, workflow stream that goes straight across from concept to post-market. Well, in fact, if you look at the FDA's total product life cycle um, chart, it's really a cycle. It's kind of the plan, do, check, act cycle. Um, so all this feedback should be driving both the product designs that we have in the market and also the product designs of future products. Now, imagine the benefits of being able to do this. Um, so one benefit is to improve um, our products so that we have greater market share. Um, one benefit is to improve the quality, safety, and efficacy of our existing products. And then finally, the, the, there's a time to market benefit of being able to use this information to more quickly uh, improve our products more quickly, um, make those changes, and also finally to reduce the risk of the products that we bring to market. Um, very often we make changes to our design, we, we try to validate that with some thought leaders, some opinion leaders, but imagine if the improvements that you are making to your product are not just validated with a few um, opinion leaders, but validated with the market in general through the feedback that, that they are providing. Um, you know, through all of these sources of information. Hopefully reducing the risk of, of misses in the market, product failures in the market, which of course are very, very expensive um, and could set companies back years in their, um, in their success trajectory. Um, so, so in conclusion, um, I just want to recap the, the three things that we talked about. We talked about um, collecting, monitoring sources of information for um, post-market surveillance. Um, we talked about analyzing that data that's coming in and kind of the, some of the new tools um, and approaches and paradigms for being able to do that um, kind of on a grander scale. And finally, to act on that information. And the key to being able to act on that information for me is to bring that, those results of that analysis to the points of use where, where it'll be used. Um, and creating these knowledge bases for product realization um, and product design, um, as well as kind of doing the baseline MDR reporting that we all need to do and are familiar with. So with that, I'll conclude and um, I'll ask everyone, uh, thank you for your time. I'll ask anyone if anyone has any questions to please um, send them through the uh, forum or in email and we'll take a look at some of those questions now. Thanks. It looks like we have uh, one question to come in so far. Um, and the question is, we have the master control complaints product right now. Can, how can that help us with the post-market items you've discussed? So this is a good question. Um, if you have complaints, the master control complaints product, um, obviously that complaints product will help you gather to um, investigate and process that complaint. It'll also help you in the process of doing your medical device reporting, um, specifically to the FDA. Um, but in addition to the complaints product itself, there are several other um, products in the master control suite that can really help. So for example, if you have uh, Kappa, which uh, many of our um, QEM and complaints customers do, um, the Kappa will help to um, investigate and to process the systemic issues that you found through your complaints process. Um, we also have a risk um, product that will help you assess the risk and manage those risk assessments. Um, in addition, um, I also talked about um, using your internal quality data um, for post-market surveillance. So we offer 
um, nonconformance, and a whole suite of other um, QEM, quality events management solutions for managing internal uh, quality incidents and bringing that together and, um, and helping to you to um, understand your post-market um, data. We also have something, uh, it's kind of an unutilized gem within Master Control, I consider. It's uh, something called the Event Analyzer, and that's something that can be used for trend analysis, something that you just set up these rules, these business rules, you turn them on, and it automatically um, looks for trends in, in your data. And so that's a very powerful tool. It's a little underutilized, and so I would highly recommend folks that are interested in post-market surveillance to look into that. And then on the horizon, we've got a couple of, of really new and exciting things coming. Um, we have a, a new analytics engine that we're working on um, that should come out sometime um, in the next year or two. And it should be very exciting. It'll, it'll bring together data from any part of master control, but specifically bringing together data from complaints and from non-conformances and um, help you in reporting that internally. And then finally, we actually have a, a new complaints module itself um, that we are in the early stages of, of working on as well, which should offer even better uh, medical device reporting um, than um, we have today, even more uh, flexible workflow, and better integration with um, the other processes within uh, the master control suite. So all just very exciting stuff that uh, both is there for you today and is also on the horizon. Um, so if you have any you know, further questions about that, you, you know, feel free to contact Master Control, um, your sales rep, or, or just call in directly in the main line. We can answer more questions on that for you. Um, I'm looking now to see if we have any other questions come in. Um, it doesn't look like we have any other questions right now. So I guess with that, I will wrap up. And um, just thank you again for your time. Thanks for sitting in and listening with us. Um, if you liked this video, if you thought it was useful, um, please you know, feel free to, to share it with other friends, colleagues, coworkers um, that you think might benefit from it. And um, thanks again for, for tuning in. We, we appreciate your, your time. So thanks. Have a good day.